welcome to Dead Man Talking. Tonight's story is from the incredible mind of 02321 over on Reddit No Sleep. As ever, please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help build the channel and our community further. Why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. And so, with that aside, let's get into tonight's story. Entitled There are agents in the woods near my grandfather's cabin. I've found out the horrifying reason why. Part 1 Let's get straight into that. My grandfather owned a cabin close to the lake, but essentially in the middle of nowhere. A bed of a walk to the town and the cell reception was nearly non-existent. He took a bad fall and broke his hip near the start of summer. The entire small town nearby heard about it. Everyone was aware he would be in hospital for a while and he didn't want the teenagers getting any ideas about breaking into his place or using his land as somewhere to party while he was gone. And somehow, I was the most trustworthy out of all of his grandchildren. The cabin didn't have the best internet connection, but I still took up his offer to house it until he literally got back on his feet. I'd never been the type for camping or any outdoor activities. The cabin lately changed my mind on that. The air was clean and it was quiet. I never knew how much background noise I adjusted to while living in the city until it was gone. I spent the first day cleaning and taking a trip into town to keep my food stocked up. My grandfather seemed to be falling behind with chores before he went to the hospital. Well, it was clear he may need to live in an assisted living home soon. Well, he would hate it, but I didn't want him to die alone in this cabin. Well, maybe I would stay here longer with him when he came back, if he would have me. I was between job and had the spare time. But by the end of the day, I was exhausted from washing every surface of thick layers of dust. I even washed all the blankets fearing what kind of insects decided to overtake them while my grandfather neglected the washing. And because I was so tired, I only barely woke up when I thought I heard something coming from the woods. Sounds of cars driving down the dirt road that led to the hiking trails further into the woods. The road was near the cabin, but so few cars passed by, it wasn't an issue. I chilled it up to phantom noises. I was used to hearing cars at night, so my brain filled in the blanks. And didn't even question the fact that that night I heard more cars going down that road than had gone down it in months. And the next morning I ate a small breakfast of toast and headed out for a short walk. A friend of mine was an artist of some sort. And before I left, he begged me to take as many photos of the woods as possible for reference photos he could use for an upcoming project. If I didn't get on it right away, well, I would forget. And yawning, I stayed within sight of the cabin, not to get lost. And when I came across a dirt road, I paused, staring at all the tracks in the dusty road. My mind went back to all of those cars I heard that night. I looked up and down the road, trying to think of any reason why so many cars would pass through. A lost person, maybe. I was about to dismiss them as old tracks, and my mind playing tricks on me. When I saw an SUV somewhat hidden down the road. I was parked off to the side of the road. A car that looked like those FBI SUVs I saw on TV. And I couldn't help myself. I started to walk towards the SUV. Curious. Someone might have got on a flat or run out of gas. I wasn't snooping. I was helping. Getting closer, I started to feel off about the entire thing. The SUV was clean as a whistle. It looked so out of place being in the woods. I raised my camera to get a shot of it when I was only a few feet away. The license plate had no hint of what state the SUV came from, only the numbers 202. Oh, this was totally weird. I snagged a quick photo, feeling a little bit guilty for some reason. This would make a great story when my grandfather came back, and then the idea came to me. If this was a government issue vehicle or part of law enforcement, then maybe all those cars last night were cop cars. What if they were hot on the case of bodies scattered around the woods? Well, I have listened to enough true crime podcasts to figure out this sort of thing happened. This would make a very great story when my grandfather came back. 
I wanted to explore a little bit more, but I knew I would get lost if I went too far into the woods. I spot on a trail near where the SUV part, I looked up and down the road, as if I was committing a crime. I followed the path, camera at the ready, in case I discovered something. And I found out two things, very quickly. I was not made for hiking, and the woods were creepy as heck. A sea of trees just expanded forwards, the sweat dripped down my face. I didn't even walk very far, but the trail I was on was on an incline, and so it made walking a bit difficult. I heard some birds chirping, but I could have sworn when I started on the path, I heard something else. A rustling, almost clicking sound I thought was leaves in the wind. I started towards the sound, trying to figure out what it was. It sounded just off enough for me to know it wasn't a natural forest sound. But when the sweat started to sting my eyes too much, I stopped to catch my breath and take a break. And I realised I was lost. Looking down, I was no longer on the real trail. Just relatively clear ground one could mistake for a trail. In a panic, I looked around trying to see where I went wrong. The wind blew, calling me off a little as the clicking sound got closer and closer as if something that was making it was moving towards me. My heart was about to beat out of my chest when I felt something on my shoulder. I let out a shrill scream and jumped on it to be held down by a large hand on my shoulder. Heart still pounding and throat dry, I looked up at a person who grabbed me. I was staring directly at a pair of sunglasses. I slowly looked over at a new person, trying to calm down. He was a head taller than me, and wearing a suit. A suit in the forest. It looked like he belonged with an SUV I'd seen earlier. His expression was neutral, but I could tell he wasn't pleased by me being in the woods. I, uh, I'm lost. I admitted weakly. Without saying a word, he started to guide me along with his hand still clasped on my shoulder. I was freaking out while trying to at least look calm. This guy reeked of secret government agent. He had the sunglasses and just needed an earpiece radio to complete the set. My guess about people looking for bodies in the woods might be right, but why would he be wearing a suit? Surely they were allowed to change their clothing while on different tasks out in the field. I suddenly got the case of the giggles because of the stress, and also because my last name was Anderson. I was being forced along by my very own Agent Smith. Oh, sorry, I just... Uh, I was thinking of the Matrix, the Mr. Anderson line. If your name was Smith and you said that to me, I would be perfect, because it's my last name. I was nervously rambling, saying the first thing that came to mind. But you're not Smith. You must be Agent 202. Or well, hearing that, he froze. His grip tightened, almost to the point it hurt. I have never been so scared in my life before. Lost in the woods with a strange agent that could do anything to me, and no one would ever find out. I looked up at him, and his emotionless face now creased in stress, and eyes hidden behind his glasses. How did you know my name? He asked, and I was taken aback by how calm and soft his voice was. I was expecting some gruff military type. Uh, your car? I sputtered, not being able to finish my thought. It really was just a guess. His code name would match what the SUV was labelled. His face eased up and I felt his grip on my shoulder relax. In fact, he almost looked embarrassed. I stay out of the woods for a few days, he warned, trying his best to sound stern. Now, we didn't talk for the rest of the way back. And when we got back on the path, he still kept a hand on my shoulder, as if I was a child, ready to bolt at any second. He might just want to be very sure I was not going to get lost again. And when we got out of the woods and onto the road, he finally released me from his grasp. My heart was pounding the entire time. I felt a mixture of fear and embarrassment, even though I'd done nothing wrong. And I was about to make a run for it when he held out his hand. It took me a few moments to figure out what he wanted. I looked down at my camera and back towards him. Bring him to close. Bring it towards myself. Bring it closer towards myself. For protection, I didn't want to give it to him. I just want to delete the photo of the SUV you took. He told me, hand still out. How did you know I took one? 
Were you watching me the entire time? I asked, eyeing him. No, you just admitted it. Please let me delete the photo, and you can have your camera back. Reluctantly, I relented. It was mostly because he asked so nicely. And also, I didn't want to be arrested and tossed into some prison without a trial for messing in government affairs. True to his word, he flipped through the photos and deleted the one of his SUV. Oddly enough, he deleted one more of the trees I took before I realised I was lost. My finger slipped. He said when he noticed me watching, he deleted one extra photo. I was a clear lion. I didn't have the guts to call him out. So, what's going on? You tracking down some bodies? Uh, looking for a killer? Aliens? I asked carefully. He did not look like he enjoyed my sense of humour. Aliens. He said it in such a straightforward tone. I almost believed him. I finally smiled fit in the stress of getting lost and bumping into him eased slightly. And turning away from me, he started back towards his parked SUV and gave me a small wave without looking back. Stay out of the woods for a few days. He warned again. I watched as he got into his car and then left me on the dirt road full of questions. My mind was buzzing. I went back to the cabin to see I was only lost for a few hours and it wasn't even noon yet. Sitting down, I found it impossible to focus on anything but trying to solve the mystery of what was going on. Now, the internet at the cabin was slower than molasses and so I went into town to use the library computer and maybe grill the locals or if they noticed anything strange lately. I spent most of the afternoon looking things up to find no local legends or strange events. I dropped by the diners for supper, and not a soul had seen any black SUVs around or any men in black prowling in the woods. Aside from finding out the diner served the world's best meatloaf, my day turned up nothing. I might let the entire thing drop if something didn't get inside the cabin that night. I was exhausted the second night in a row. Fear does that to you. I still felt a little bit jittery, but passed out into a deep sleep shortly after settling in. And in the dead of the night, I felt myself coming out of a dream, confused on what had woke me up. I sat up, still half asleep, and trying to focus. It was pitch dark, and I fumbled around for the lamp beside the bed. Listening, I thought I heard some noises coming from downstairs. It was hard to hear over the beating of my own thumping heart. Grabbing a flashlight from the dresser beside the bed, I gathered up my courage to go down and check it out. I prayed it was just a raccoon that had somehow got inside to get the Twinkies I bought earlier. More clattering came from the kitchen and made me freeze up. I clutched the flashlight against my chest as if it could protect me, and creeping down the stairs, I was aware the noise of my own clothing was making, and every creak in the wood. It felt like it took me hours to finally get to the bottom of the steps. And tiptoeing, I kept going towards the kitchen. But there was no door, and I kept the flashlight down not to alert whatever was inside the kitchen. Pots and pans came clattering down, and it nearly made me run for it. I sounded much bigger than a hungry raccoon. My hands were shaking as I raised the light, trying to see what was rooting around in the cupboards. Raising the flashlight... I pointed it into the dark room, not seeing anything at first. A flurry of motion came from the top cupboard. The dark shape came crashing down, knocking over chairs and tipping the table. I could have matched the silhouette of any animal that I was aware of. Scratches were left behind in a hardwood floor, and the creature rushed out, nearly knocking out the back door from its frame. Well, I was not going to chase after it. I'd almost wet myself. After all, I was a city person. Wild animals breaking into my place in the middle of the night was not what I normally dealt with. Not knowing whatever to do, I called the cops, begging them to come over and look over the damage. The two officers came over about an hour later. I turned on all the lights but didn't dare go into the kitchen. They both looked a bit annoyed having to come over in the dead of the night, but I could also tell the trip was slightly better than a boring night shift. Well, they humoured me by looking over my invaded kitchen area. Ah, can you describe this animal? One of the officers asked while carefully stepping over a fallen pan. 
I was really dark. I said being very unhelpful. Big or small, flying around. Uh, Biggish, like bigger than a house cat. I don't know about anything that would make marks like this. And we all looked at the deep scratch marks left on the hardwood flooring and countertops. Long, four gouges scarred the wood. Low with some long single cuts into the wood. I looked over my food and the only thing I was missing was a box of table salt. I wasn't aware the cabin already had an open box of salt before. I bought some more. Well, the open box was knocked over, spilling over the counter. The stolen box was punctured by whatever took it and left a trail of salt behind. And aside from minor damage, it didn't look all that serious. I almost felt embarrassed calling them. Almost. Uh, how do you think it got inside? I asked looking at the still open back door. Uh, raccoons have hands, the younger cop commented. We all stood in silence for a while until all three of us burst out laughing. The mental image of a raccoon breaking in and opening the back door was just too much for us. At least the cops weren't angry, and the city guy called them out down in the middle of the night for nothing. Oh, you must have just forgotten to lock your back door. These coons are smart around here. You should be thankful you don't need a rabies shot right now. I agreed with him. We fixed the back door to the best we could for the moment. One of them gave me a number of their brother who could swing by and repair my door the next afternoon. We all decided a raccoon was the culprit, but none of us wanted to talk about how a raccoon could do so much damage to the door. I thanked them again for the help and sent them on their way, but I still didn't turn the lights off to sleep that night. I was pretty worn out from the exciting night. I took a nap before a call for the back door to be repaired. I didn't take very long considering. The repairman let me pay him in two six-packs, which is very fair. With my only chore of the day accomplished, I could not help myself. I followed the tracks whatever animal left behind in the night to the tree line. I debated on what to do. I would easily get lost if I kept following the tracks inside the woods. The warning the agent gave still rang through my mind, and a thought came to me. Maybe he was still around. Yes, I did want to believe that a raccoon broke in to steal my soul, but on the off chance it wasn't a coon, I wanted to see if he would spill the beans and what exactly was going on in these woods. I didn't have any way of finding him, though. Making up my mind, I figured just walking down the road wouldn't do any harm. I might be lucky and spot his SUV parked somewhere again. I couldn't get lost on a road going one way. And by pure chance, my crazy plan worked. I started walking down the dirt road. The summer sun nearly roasted me alive. Aside from that, the walk wasn't too bad. I could hear splashing of families playing in the lake hidden by the trees. Birds chirped away, and when the wind blew, it called me down enough to keep walking. I was about to turn around, I head back when I heard a car start coming down the road. In turning my head, I saw a large SUV in the distance. I started to feel excited. Something was going on, and I might be able to get some answers. Now three SUVs drove past me, each stopping half a mile from my position. I picked up my pace to walk over and see what was going on. Black figures came out from the cars and into the woods. By the time I reached the parked cars, everyone was so far gone on the trail, I no longer could see them. No one remained by the cars, and I didn't get a good look at who even just walked into the woods, let alone how many of them there was. Or at least, I thought no one stayed behind. Coming down the trail was the agent that guided me out of the woods. He saw me, and it was hard to decipher his expression behind his sunglasses and at a distance. I raised my hand to give him a wave, and he also raised his hand to make a shoe in motion towards me. As he walked closer, he scowled at me. I'm just taking a walk. I'm staying out of the woods. I told him in a bit too much of a smart-ass tone than I should. Don't press your luck. He hissed the moment it was close enough for me to hear him. Ignoring me, he walked over to one of the SUVs and opened the back door. He lifted a solid black box made of some sort of metal out. His hands full, I did him a favour and closed the door for him. He glared down, eyes hidden. 
Can I help you carry anything? I offered no thinking. He would take me up on it. If you can lift this, I'll let you carry it to the meeting area. Selling the box down, he waited. Rolling up my imaginary sleeves, I bent over, confident in my noodle arms. I couldn't even budge it or even get any kind of grip on the damn thing. My struggling was in vain. The agent put me out of my mercy and picked up the heavy box from the ground with ease. I felt as if he was teasing me. I felt like being able to tease someone was something he rarely was able to do. And so I let it go. I was just warming up, I said, sweat dripping down from my face. He stared at me silently, most likely thinking how I survived being as dumb as I was. Stay out of the woods. It's for your own good. Repeating his warning again, he turned to leave me behind as I completely forgot to ask about my little break-in. I could tell he wasn't going to tell me anything, even if I did. I felt like it was because he arrived with people. If he was alone, he might be more forgiven with his hints. Well, something was going on and I still don't know a damn thing. I swore the moment it cooled off, I was going to go down that trail and see what they were up to. So far, it didn't look like they were hunting anyone, but I just couldn't deal with not knowing. Walking back to the cabin had worn me out so much that I nearly collapsed. The summer heat was no joke. I took a quick cool shower to try and not get a heat stroke, and by accident slept away the afternoon. How on earth did anyone wear a suit in this weather? There are agents in the woods near my grandfather's cabin. I found out the horrifying reason why. Part 2. Let's get straight into that. When I woke up, I sat up confused at what time it was. Orange light was streaming in. I drew back the curtains to look outside at the trees swaying in the wind. Cabin life wasn't at all that bad, aside from strange animals breaking into my place. Well, it was far too late in the day to walk down to the path and investigate, and instead I did something I wanted to do since I arrived. I grabbed some beers and walked down the trail to the lake. Well, if I could find some fishing poles, maybe I'd spend a few days just drinking and fishing. But only after I figured out the mystery of who Agent 202 was and what organization he worked for. When I came to the end of the short trail heading down to the lake, I stood staring in shock at the strange coincidence before me. This man really was everywhere, in these woods. I saw the agent before he saw me, his ankles deep on the lake, his shiny shoes on the shore, suit pants rolled up, and trying to keep them dry but failing. He was filling up two watering cans with lake water. And because he was bent over, he didn't see me walk up. When he did raise his head, it looked like he rolled his eyes behind his sunglasses. But don't look at me like that. I'm staying at my grandfather's cabin. You're the one invading my lakefront. He started towards me, his black hair slightly dishevelled from his work. I was the only spot I could pull up the truck. Looking over, I spotted a brand new truck pulled up as close to the dock as possible without getting stuck on the downward slope towards the lake shore. In the truck bed was a half-filled water tank. Was he trying to fill that huge tank with just those two little watering cans? As if reading my mind, he walked past carrying his full pails towards the truck. I had the pump is broken and we run out of water. I'm not needed until later tonight, so this is busy work, he explained. I had nothing else to do, so I shoved the beers halfway into the sand and suddenly stood in front of him and hand out to take a pail. He gave me a raised eyebrow, but still handed me one so I could help. I kicked off my sandals, and we suddenly figured out a system of me refilling the pails by the time he came back from dumping one into the opening on the tank. And we worked until the sun set, but there was still enough light left to see by. Ugh, my back is killing me. Well, let's take a break. I had barely done any work, but I still felt like I earned my beer. Getting out of the ankle-deep water, I sat down regretting walking through the sand with wet feet. I'll never get the sand off. The beer was still a bit cool. I offered it to the agent, still working away, filling the pails. He looked at me and then at the lake, considering my offer. When I shook the beer, trying to entice him, he finally gave in and walked over. Sitting down next to me, 
It appeared he didn't care in the slightest if his suit got covered in sound. He grimaced at the first swig of his drink as if he didn't drink often. Well, we didn't speak for a while. We just stared out into the peaceful water and the woods beyond it. He took off his sunglasses because it was now too dark to see with them. I cast a quick glance over at his face, trying not to be suspicious. I hadn't seen his full face yet, and he caught my eyes with his catch of me staring. His eyes were blue, not a normal blue I'd ever seen before. No, he looked like eyes of a dead man. I quickly looked away, suddenly frightened of him. I considered his eyes may look so dull because he had some sort of condition that affected his sight. Although he didn't seem to have any issues getting around, or if he did, I felt a little ashamed of my reaction. What's your name? He asked me, dragging me from my thoughts. We never introduced ourselves when we first met. Adam, I replied. Adam Anderson? My parents named me after my grandfather. They're not very original. Uh, do you have a name? It was meant as an innocent question anyone should be able to answer. He did not look over at me and stared forward with his dead eyes on the lake as he took a sip of his beer, considering the question. The hesitation made me nervous. It meant he might not really have a name besides Agent 202. That was some really deep government-level stuff. Being raised without a name to only do one job. I fit and started to creep up my spine, as if I shouldn't know the very small amount of information I already did. From across the lake, lights started to flash in the woods. Bright ones, as if someone was testing out spotlights somewhere from inside the trees. Is something bad going to happen? I asked quietly. No. Sacrifices are going to have to be made to keep the peace. I felt his cold eyes on me. I felt sweat starting to form at the base of my neck. That one statement carried so much weight. I knew if I asked him to say any more, or he would refuse. And I already knew far too much. A cracking static sound made him move, his intense gaze from me and towards the truck. He walked over to it, and I forced myself to calm down a little. Reaching inside the open window, he pulled out a radio receiver to answer the call. I eavesdropped, not knowing what was best for me. 202 here. A language I didn't know came through the static. The agent, or he could understand what was being said, and scowled. Damn it. Of course he arrived early. Hans is such an ass. All right, I'll be there. Keep him busy. And with a small growl, he placed the radio back inside the truck and went around to get inside. I stood up collecting his half-finished beer along with my own. I had enough state of mind not to litter in the lakefront. Well, hearing him say my name was a little strange. Leaning towards the truck, I gave him my attention. Well, I keep saying this, but stay out of the woods. Well, his odd eyes bore into mine until... I could no longer hold his gaze. I looked away, but nodded, showing I understood. I just wished I... wished I knew what was going on. That's all. That's human nature to be curious. But what is happening is not meant for you to know. So please. He didn't need to repeat himself. Whatever was happening was well beyond me. He was looking out for me by making sure I was going to stay away from the truth. And I fully planned on letting it drop. As far as I could tell in that moment, there was nothing that I could do. I watched as he pulled the truck out and away down the road, feeling a little bitter. I might not ever fully know what he was warning me away from. Looking over, I saw more lights flickering in the woods and sounds of music drifting along the lake. Bugs were making my exposed skin into a meal, so I headed back to the cabin, head swimming with questions. And the next day I found myself bored and pacing the cabin. I'd seen more cars travelling down the dirt road and through the trees the entire morning. I was going stir crazy. Unless I left, I would go charging into those woods, trying to see what was going on. I went into town instead. Unsure of how long I was going to be around for, I decided on signing up for a library card. And taking out books and movies should keep away my boredom long enough to keep me out of trouble. I went through the process and was looking through their meager movie selection when I heard a voice call my name. Adam, is that you? I turned towards the voice to see a man around my grandfather's age. He looked confused for a moment before his face cleared. Ah, you must be his grandson. Christ, you look just like him when he was your age. Thought I was losing my marbles. I smiled at him, realizing he was a friend of my grandfather's. 
I abandoned a movie search and went over to him to introduce myself, even though it wasn't needed. I'd always known I was named after my grandfather, but I never once heard someone call him Adam before. He went by his middle name of John, and that was what I knew him by. We shook hands, and I followed the man to a sit-in area. My grandfather broke his hip, so I'm cabin sitting. I get pretty bored up there. I explained. It does get boring there. Nothing much happens in this town at all. I suppose that's why some people like living here so much. Well, I started debating on if I wanted to bring up the topic of the strangers in the woods. I've been seeing men in suits around. Is it like a FBI training camp around or something? A dark emotion flickered over the older man's face. I started to think I might have stepped on a landmine. He shook his head trying to clear his thoughts and decide on his words. You and your grandfather are alike. Years ago, he talked about the same thing. Man in the woods around his cabin. And? I leaned forward, heart beating and waiting on the man to finish. I was excited I might get some answers and wondered why my grandfather never mentioned any of this before. Uh, He did the smart thing. He settled down with your grandmother and stopped looking into it. I couldn't help but let out a long sigh and lean back in an oversized plush armchair. I was disappointed and the older man chuckled at me. (laughs) There was another reason why. He stopped talking about it and carried on with your grandmother. Adam, your grandfather was the uptight suit-wearing kind of man. He came here from somewhere and the town thought he showed up looking for something. Mostly everyone thought he was a government man doing a land survey or something along those lines. What made him settle down here if he was an office type and not the outdoor kind of guy? Was it love at first sight when he saw my grandmother? I mused. Love at first sight? Well, maybe, but not with your grandmother. Now he kept questioning the locals about men in suits appearing in the woods. He chased the leads around and we first thought he was a bit off his rocker until a stranger came into town a few times. He wore a suit, but the odd thing was, he bought all the live fishing bait and a massive amount of meals to go with the diner. We all assumed Adam, his grandfather, was chasing after answers. But after a set of campers caught him and a man wearing a suit in a a compromising position in the woods, we started to think otherwise. And the man gave me a look over his glasses and I knew what he was implying. I felt my face flush a little and I knew why my grandfather didn't want to talk about the men in the woods. My family most likely didn't know anything about this. It almost felt like I was invading my grandfather's privacy in some way. If he was like that, why would he get with my grandmother? He married her because he also loved her. Anyone could see that. I'm sure he was happy with her. However... His eyes still looked towards the woods in such a long and sort of way it always hurt to see. I'm scared you're going down the same path. Ignore whatever is going on in those woods. I had nearly ruined your grandfather, and a few locals that are aware of it pretends it not to be. You'll promise me you'll stay out of it, right? I've seen one of those men wearing suits, but only once. Anyone with eyes like that, that isn't natural. Well, he stopped speaking drifting off deep into thought about a distant memory that still haunted him. I nodded once again, being warned off for my own good. All these warnings might not keep me from going inside the woods, but I still wanted to go around asking questions. Now hearing that the locals tend to pretend as if nothing was going on, I doubted that I would get any answers. Still, it might be worth a shot to start sleuthing a little. What else did I have to do all day? My grandfather's friend, didn't look convinced that I would behave. He'd done his duty and couldn't do much more if I decided to keep meddling. I kept telling myself that I would drop the matter. And then little bits of information came luring back in. We spoke for a little bit longer before he needed to excuse himself and be on his way. I picked out some books that I deep down knew I wasn't going to read. There are agents in the woods near my grandfather's cabin. I found out the horrifying reason why. Part 3. Let's 
get straight into that. I tried speaking to the librarian while I was checking out the books about strange events, but she couldn't think of any. She was kind enough to direct me towards the grocery store, saying they deal with all kinds of residents in the small town and may know more than her. I really should have dropped the entire thing, but I now knew men in suits been around since my grandfather's time. How often did they appear? Only once since then. Was this a every other year event? I should have called my grandfather, but he was still in hospital. I didn't want to disturb his rest any more than I really needed. I doubted he would tell me anything when I did call. Well, he may be ashamed of what he got up to before he met my grandmother. Well, if I couldn't figure out anything from the locals, I might go and see him as a last resort. And a gas station and the grocery store were so close together, they might as well be the same building. Well, when I went inside, I grabbed something little to snack on. The cashiers weren't busy at all, and while walking past the meat section, I saw it was nearly empty. Well, that wasn't too strange in itself. They might just have their delivery truck running behind. The teenage girl working at the cash register was close enough to the meat section to watch me look over the empty shelves, confused. Are you new to the area? She called out to me, startling me. I nodded and walked up to her. Well, what gave it away? Well, around this time of year, we have issues with the meat and the egg delivery. Because the locals know it, they buy what they need beforehand. What we normally have gets bought up for like this barbecue happening somewhere in the camping areas. Well, she already rang up my single item and I paused with my card in my hand, about to pay. A barbecue? What do you mean? I asked, feeling as if I was getting somewhere. Well, what else could it be? Well, it's got to be like a company retreat or something. Business guy shows up and buys all our meat and stuff. Why, well, it takes like two weeks to get stuck back up after. Business guys? Like men in suits? I said carefully. She nodded but didn't seem too interested in her answer. I paid and she handed me my item. Not wanting to waste a bag, I just took it from her. Gotta be a big company to buy so much food for people. Weirdly enough, like, this has happened since I was young, but I never ever seen where they go. All the camping sites aren't taking over, and there aren't any traces of a party. Maybe our prices are cheaper, so they buy stuff here and go somewhere else. She offered. I nodded. Her theory was sound. If I hadn't seen the strange things the past two days, I might have agreed with her. On my way out, I noticed a box set up for people to donate food items. I placed my box of oatmeal bars inside of it on my way out. I got some information from the trip, and so well, it was worth it. Next, I headed over to the bait shop. If I ever wanted to go fishing, I would need some new bait after I found where my grandfather hid away the pools. Well, everything was within walking distance on the main street. I didn't see many people out as I walked down the street, and so far, the locals either didn't notice the strange men about or didn't see them as anything threatening. I considered that I was taking all of this out of context, and everything that was going on might have had an innocent explanation. Hell, Agent 202 could be messing with me, for all I knew. I was the one thinking what was going on was weird. He could be making it all appear sinister, just for fun, or to keep me off track of the real answers. Well, inside the bait shop, it was empty, a sign from an older man sitting behind the counter, and reading a magazine. He did a double take when I walked in. Setting aside his magazine, he looked as if he wanted to speak with me. Is your last name Anderson? He asked me. Yes, I'm John's grandson. I told him I was stopping on the front of the counter. He looked a bit younger than my grandfather, but he still might have known him. He looked me over again, and a small smile formed on his face when he recognized my features. Ah, you look like him. He was a bit older when we first met, but... I would guess you look like he did when he was your age. Well, how's he doing? I looked at his name tag to see the man's name was Darry. I scanned my memories to see if my grandfather had mentioned him before. And then again, we never spoke much before, and when we did, he liked to listen more than speak. Uh, hip broken, but as far as I know, he's doing all right. I've been meaning to call him. I might when I get back to the house. As I spoke, I looked around the shop. The small fridge was empty of life bait near the counter. It was just as my other grandfather's friend had mentioned. And for some reason, the men in suits came around and bought out the bait, meat, and meals without the locals, finding it strange. 
Something got inside my place the other night. I'm a city guy, so I'm not sure what it could have been. Do you know about any critters that can open doors? I wasn't sure what kind of question I should ask him. I felt that this was normal enough to inquire about. Huh. Raccoon, most likely. If it was anything else, uh, you'd know. Bears tend to be noticeable, and you wouldn't normally walk away from one barging inside your place. Uh, your grandfather always had issues with animals getting inside. Uh, he was never angry about it. He just replaced the doors pretty often. And so this was a reoccurring event, and my grandfather never told me about it. Did he just hope that I wouldn't find out about these strange events until he got back? He would have told me something if he wanted me to look into it. Or he could think that I was smart enough not to poke my nose around like it currently was. Eh, did you come in for bait? I'm out of the fresh stuff, but I can recommend some packaged ones. Well, I snapped out of the train of thought and nodded. I let him guide me to the bait section and told me all the sorts of information about different ones and what they were best for. Well, it was all lost on me, but it seemed like he enjoyed talking to someone, and so I listened. I picked out a package he recommended, and when I did start fishing, I would have to come back here for lessons. Well, how does one run out of life bait? I asked while paying. Well, around this time every year, we figured there's a big business getaway. Some guys in suits that come in and buy up everything we got. Must be a big company to need so much. And has to be one that's been in the family for years. Well, I paused and watched his expression. That last statement was innocent enough, but the reasoning for it made Derry look a little embarrassed over thinking about it. I waited for him to keep going, and when he noticed, he looked away. I've lived my entire life here. I was younger when your grandfather showed up, but I remember something happened back then. A boy got lost in the woods, and well, he was never found. The thing was, one of those business guys did when the retreat helped us look. You see, the other day, the weird thing was I could have sworn I, I saw the same guy. Well, he hadn't aged a day. It must be a grandson. I mean, you look like your grandfather. So, whatever company is buying the bait every year, must be a big one to afford it. And passed it down to the kids for the same looking guy to show up. Well, I smiled at him, hoping I didn't look tense. This was well worth the cost of the bait I just bought. I didn't know what I was going to do with this new information, but it was another piece to the puzzle. I was slowly putting together. I think you're totally right on that, I said, trying to act normal. I heard a car driving slowly down the street, and I thought it was a black one. I got distracted and wanted to chase after it, but didn't want to be rude to Darry. Well, when John comes back, tell him we need to go fishing again. I still owe him for what he did for me, after all. Darry was smiling, and I looked back at him. Black car, forgotten. What did he help you out with? Ah, he didn't tell you? He asked, looking a bit shocked. When I shook my head, he kept talking. Well, I have a son. A bit older than yourself. He's never dated and rumors started to spread. Why, well, it's a small town and some people have backward ideas. When some local guys found out he was dating a man, they jumped him and then he put him in hospital. They went to the bar after, bragging about it. I didn't even know what happened, but somehow John found out. Well, he walked right into that bar, rifle in hand. Without saying a word, he shot the ringleader in the foot and just beat the shit out of the other three. I stood, speechless. I never heard anything about that. Aside from strange events in the woods, my grandfather kept a lot more secrets. And with a town this small, I didn't understand how. This wasn't the first thing I'd heard about. When I introduced myself, how is he not arrested? I asked dumbfounded. Because my son was dating the sheriff. I felt a smile come to my face. Sometimes, small town cops looking the other way worked out for the better. And those guys should be thankful. It was good old Grandpa John kicking their asses, and not the sheriff taking revenge for what happened. Ah, he did have his guns taken away, so I doubt you still have any in the cabin. Darry explained. I hadn't checked the cabin for guns yet. It was a little bit embarrassing, considering something already broke into the place. I was raised without them in my life, and even forgot in some places that they were common. <laughs> I honestly didn't think about looking for some, but I'm glad to know that it would have been a wasted effort trying to find them if I did. Well, how is your son doing now? Oh, he's fine. He recovered, but the guys who beat him up all have limbs that haven't healed up yet. 
Him and the sheriff got married shortly after. It happened so. Everyone around found out about them. Two years and they're going strong. Two years? So this happened recently? And considering how old my grandfather was, it was impressive that he could still take out a full-grown man at his age. I would really need to call him later and ask him about this. We spoke a little bit more before I promised to drop by again when I found the fishing poles. I gave Darry a wave out and started back down the main road, my stomach rumbling. Since I'd enjoyed the meal at the diner the last time, I thought having dinner there would be a good idea. Dark storm clouds were rolling in, threatening in a storm. I might get caught up in it, depending on how long my meal was. I found a seat and ordered a meatloaf again. Ah, you're lucky we just made a fresh batch. A guy in a suit ordered nearly everything we had to be taken out and delivered somewhere. Gabby, my waitress, commented as she collected my menu. Where is it all going? I asked, hoping for any more scraps of information that I could get. Huh? I'm not sure. He picked it up and loaded it all into his big car. Strange enough, he ordered fried eggs and almost everything. I guess it would work for meatloaf or some rice dishes, but on sandwiches? It was weird. I nodded. At least I knew the agent liked fried eggs. The massive amount of food and cars going into the woods felt like a gathering of people was happening. But who and what did they arrive for? It was not a business retreat. That was for sure. Uh, you know, it doesn't sound too bad. Would it be too much trouble adding a fried egg on the side of a meatloaf? Gabby gave me a look, but nodded her head with a smile. It might be gross in the end, but I did like my meatloaf and egg, so it might not turn out too bad. It wasn't. In fact, I enjoyed it. I might just try tossing an egg on top of everything, within reason. Getting up after my meal, I went to the front to pay, and as Gabby was giving me my change, I heard a rumbling outside. The sky had gotten darker, and rain could come down at any minute. I wondered if I should make a run for it, or maybe wait out there for a bit. And just then, the sheriff came in. I had never met him, but I could tell who he was, based on his uniform. Gabby, has Sally Ann come by recently? He asked, his voice sounded somewhat strange. I come to think about it, she hasn't. She normally comes by to collect her bottles. Uh, what's up? Gabby started to look a little bit worried. I got out of their way, but still, I listened in. Uh, her mother hasn't seen her for a few hours. Uh, she's a little bit worried, and I've been checking around. So far, we haven't found anything. Uh, is she missing? Gabby said, suddenly pale and nervous. No, I wouldn't go that far just yet. Maybe she just took a nap somewhere, or just forgot to tell her mother where she was going. Uh, you know how she can be. But if she doesn't turn up soon, I get a group together to start looking. I felt stress start to build up in my gut. The agent's words came back to my mind about how sacrifices needed to be made. If I brought that up now, I might be labelled as a nut. Aside from them being in town to buy bait and food, no one had seen the agents in the woods. Not only that, but a boy went missing before when my grandfather first arrived. This all didn't feel like a coincidence. I debated on what to do. After all, I had no proof that they were responsible for the missing girl. She may have just wandered off and forgot to call home. But a dark feeling was creeping into my thoughts and I was unable to believe that she was safe somewhere. Rain started to come down outside as more thunder rumbled. We all looked out the window worried about the missing girl and praying she was just somewhere safe. There are agents in the woods near my grandfather's cabin, and I found out the horrifying reason why. The finale. Let's get straight into that. I offered my services to the sheriff if he needed someone to go out looking with him. He thanked me, telling me he would keep that in mind, and hurried off to the next spot to check. The rain was starting to come down. Not hard, but I was soaked by the time I got back to the cabin. I got changed into some dry clothing, my stomach twisting from the stress. On looking outside, I saw the sky was getting darker by the second. I worried about the missing girl. If she was out there, she would be in a bad spot when the rain came down. And what if those agents did take her for something? 
That 202 didn't seem like the type, but I couldn't vouch for the others. Well, I wanted to talk to my grandfather about everything I'd learned. Since he was staying so far away, I called the hospital. I didn't want to leave for an entire day trip while the girl was missing. I found out that I couldn't reach him. He tried to get out of bed too soon after his hip surgery and was rushed back in to get the damage fixed. And that was a few hours ago. My father was in the emergency contact, and the hospital would have no reason to call me. I assume my father didn't want to stress me out until he knew what was going on. And with speaking to my grandfather no longer being a current option, I decided there was only one thing left to do. I was going into the woods. The sun hadn't set, but it was dark and overcast by the time I was ready to leave again. I found an oversized raincoat and a flashlight. I didn't own any rain boots, so my feet would get wet on this trip. And double checking, I made sure I had my cell phone and breathed the storm outside. When walking down the dirt road, I kept slipping on the mud and watched for any cars. There weren't any tracks due to the rain, and I didn't see any parked SUVs like before. The path was so hidden without the SUV marking it, and then he walked right by it, then gathering up my courage, I walked along being careful not to trip. Oh, the forest felt like a living creature that didn't want me to be near it. The trees felt as if they were closing in on me out of the corners of my eye. Each lightning flash brought more fear and stress. I thought that I was seeing shadows darting between the trees. An unnaturally cold wind blew and my teeth chattered from fear. I didn't know what this girl looked like. I assumed I would just run into Agent 202 again. He might answer my questions if it was about a missing girl. I felt like he was a decent man, just stuck with a menacing job. I was only in the woods for a short while, but I was already fairly lost. Hearing rustling behind me, I looked over trying to see the cause of the noise. At first, I didn't notice it. Then... Movements barely within my eyeline made me look up. And on a tree branch over nine feet in the air was what looked like a wet sleeping bag. I looked at it confused on how it got up there and why anyone would put it up there. And then I realized it looked full. Not like an empty sleeping bag draped on a tree branch. At the moment that realization hit me, the upper part of the bag turned towards me. A pure white face looked down at me, nearly all of it being taken up by a twisted smile. I nearly dropped my flashlight when I bolted. I didn't even scream. I just ran as fast as I could away from whatever I'd just seen. While I ran in mid-panic, I saw more of those shapes in the trees and jumped over a few in the bushes. They looked like they were wrapped in a fabric but almost had a caterpillar body. Knobs acting like feet started to move when I ran past. And I didn't look behind me. I just ran for my life. Aside from their faces, they didn't look all that frightening. I didn't know if they were a joke or some sort of forest creature. And I was not sticking around to find out. As I ran, I started to hear the voices. Small voices carried on the wind, nearly drowned out by the pattering of the rain on my jacket hood. Stay. Offering. Wait. Wait. The raspy voices begged me not to leave them behind, and I was not going to listen to them. I tripped over a root and smashed into the ground. My knees shot pain through my entire body, and my elbow got that fuzzy feeling from hitting my funny bone. I couldn't breathe, so I curled up against a tree, trying to recover. I sat wheezing, sore and cold, and scared out of my mind. The rain was a drizzle, but thunder rumbled, and I could hear them. The sound of their bodies moving in the woods. The same rustling sound I thought was wind through the trees when I first ran into 202. These things had been in the woods the entire time. I didn't know if one had broken into my kitchen or if it was something else. In gulping down air, I was ready to run again when I saw a pale face peek out from the bushes and smiled at me a few feet away. What the hell was happening in these woods? I never ran so much and so hard in my life. The lack of oxygen to my brain made me dizzy. I could have been going in circles for all I knew. I flew into a clearing, tripping over my own feet and falling hard onto the ground. And I stayed panting 
while rain started to drizzle down harder. The sky oh, it was so grey, it was as if the sun had already set, and I looked up, sweat and rain dripping from my face. My throat was raw from running. Beyond the clearing, I saw a shape and my heart had nearly stopped. I breathed a sigh of relief when the head raised up so I could tell that it was just a harmless deer. It looked at me, wary, and because I didn't move or get closer to it, it regarded me as harmless. The thing waiting above the deer, however, was not. A blur of motion came from the tree and the thump of it landing on the deer's back made my skin crawl. For some reason, the deer didn't run. It let out a horrible sound of distress and collapsed, so I could no longer see the deer or the creature that landed on top of it. And I waited, entire body tense. A ripping sound drifted between the sounds of rain and the deer, while I stayed silent. And finally, after hearing hints of something horrible happening, more tearing sounds came as a new creature stood up. It looked like a, a little deer. It had a human face and legs. So many legs, a long body covered in fabric. I gasped as it looked at me. Smiles so wide that its eyes were scrunched up. Again, I did not stay to see what the hell was going on. I scrambled back to my feet and started running. My chest burning, but the creatures in the woods were a very good motivation to keep going. I heard the new deer-like creature start after me. The bushes and tree branches being knocked aside as it moved. More of the creatures fell out of the trees, landed onto the ground without wet, sounding thuds. Some behind me, some in front. And I kept moving while those thuds came from behind. After each sound of an impact, small feet started. I was being chased by these creatures, and I didn't have any way of ditching them. In such a situation, you can understand why I did something so desperate as to run towards the first artificial lights that I saw. And through the trees on my left was a blinding light. I changed course to run towards it, nearly tripping over one of those caterpillar-shaped creatures on the way. I heard their little footsteps getting closer and closer. I wasn't going to make it. I even felt the breath of a larger one on my neck as I ran. And with one final push, I launched myself into the light, rolling along the wet cock grass and panting and scared out of my wits. I sat up with my mouth open and begged for help and froze. My entire body shut down at what I saw. It was a circle, completely cleared of trees and trimmed grass. Spotlights were set up to surround the area and shone directly into the middle of the clearing. Men in suits stood at equal distance from each other. I just run into the middle of two of them, making them stare at me in utter confusion. All of them had black hair and looked very similar to the agent that I'd met. An agent at the far side started to run towards me the moment I sat up, and it was my guess that he was Agent 202 running to get me the hell out of what I just stumbled into. Now, the two in the middle of the clearing were so unnatural that my brain just stopped working. I sat staring in shock at the creature at least 12 feet tall. It looked a little like the creatures in the woods that I was running from. It had dark, shining fabric covering its long body and making it look as if it was covered in oil. It curled around itself, a human-like face looking towards me, giving that same unsettling smile the other monsters did. Instead of stubby arms, this monster's body was lying with human arms down the far side, far too many of them for me to count. And the smile grew even wider the longer it looked in my direction, to the point where it looked as if it was going to take up its entire face. And a man in black beside the creature was so surprised at my sudden arrival, he dropped a black metal box he was about to hand to the monster. The box tipped over, spilling out gore and blood into the wet grass. Gore kept spilling out, spreading beyond them. It was as if it was never going to stop pouring from such a small space. Oh, what a treat! The creature got down and flew towards me, moving quickly, using its countless hands and tearing up clots of dirt and grass. And I was unable to move or save myself. Right before a large mouth tore into my body, I was pushed aside. The monster grabbed my saviour. 
It kept going, now with a man wearing a suit locked in its jaws. They both slammed against a tree, causing the rest of the men wearing suits to scatter, looking confused of what to do. And I felt sick. Without a doubt, my life is just saved by 202. He just sacrificed himself after he warned me again and again to stay out of the woods. He was still alive, pinned against the tree as the monster tore into his shoulder, blood staining the ground. He was trying in vain to get the jaws away from him. Face twisted in pain, he looked over in my direction, silently begging for me to run. My legs were so unstable. Powerful arms grabbed me and lifted me painfully off the ground. One of the men in suits was now facing me. Face twisted in so much rage, he might as well have been foaming at the mouth. You! Do you have any idea what you have just done? Hans, drop that trash and come over to eat this one! He snapped. The monster looked over in our direction, the agent still dangling from its mouth. No, bring the newcomer over here. My voice came and it made everyone stop moving. They all looked as scared as I felt. The man, who was flushed with rage a second ago, now paled. I looked over to see whose voice it was. Past where the blood and gore that was still pulling from the box was a white shape. It was so white my eyes hadn't seen it when they were adjusting to the glaring spotlights. It looked like a layer of nearly transparent sheets piled on top of each other, being held up by one point underneath. Now the voice was so pleasant and the fabric looked inviting, but the thought of going near it scared me far more than anything I'd seen so far. The men recovered and started to drag me along. I finally regained some sense to resist them, but they were too strong. I was dragged along, getting blood soaked through my shoes when we went through it. I felt sick. I prayed that the missing girl wasn't a part of that gore pile. We stopped and the layer of fabric opened up just enough for me to see a pair of feet. Clawed, segmented feet as pale as the glossy sheets they hid behind. What a troublesome family you are. The voice was soft, but it made my body react in the same way nails on a chalkboard would. My lord, should you really be... One of the men who held me on my feet started to ask, Are you questioning me, child? That soft voice called him. I felt his hand shake as he kept holding onto my upper arm. Who, who the hell are you? I asked, voice trembling so hard, I barely got the words out. That is none of your concern. The voice answered me. It is! I turned my head to see Agent 202 still hanging from the monster's mouth. His body turned to face us, and blood dripped of his black suit. As of an hour ago, this man is the landowner. We need his permission to. And the creature tightens its jaws shut. I heard bones cracking as the agent fell limp, no longer able to speak. I nearly got sick seeing such a thing. I shook, but out of rage from someone I was starting to consider as a friend being killed in front of me. My grandfather owned land around the cabin, and I never knew just how much of it was his. If I was now the owner, then my grandfather had passed away. But how would they know about his death before me? Oh, I needed answers. Feeling a bit braver because of my anger, I turned back towards the hidden figure. I demand to know what he was talking about, and why that creature just killed him. I wanted to sound intimidating, but the tears in my eyes, or oh, they ruined it. Oh no, 202 is not dead. It takes more to kill one of my children. But I suppose I do need to explain a few things to make this meeting valid. Lifting the veil like fabric I saw more of the one who was speaking with me. They had a slim body dressed in a glimmering white layer. A pair of thin legs peeked from the cut of their dress-like outfit. The pale legs looked as if they should belong to a bull-jointed doll and with claws for feet. Their face was still hidden, and chest somewhat flat, making it impossible to really tell the gender. We require permission from the owner of the land, so we can do our yearly meetings. In exchange, I shall give the landowner anything 
they wished for. The creature whispered towards me. It reached a hand out and touched under my chin with just the tip of a clawed finger. A warm feeling spread through my body like I just sank into the most relaxing bath ever. My eyes closed and head dropped. If I wasn't being held up, I would have fallen asleep from that slight touch. In the back of my mind, I wondered what it would feel like if this creature placed its entire hand on my shoulder. I shook the cotton from my head when a fingertip was drawn away. That agent, if he's still alive, get him medical attention. I mumbled, pulling myself out of that warm feeling and back into the coldness of the real world. Oh, that's it? The voice asked, sounding less graceful than before. I kept shaking my head, trying to think. It did say that I could ask for anything, but that might mean more than one thing. I could try and save 202 because he'd saved my life. And if he lived through this, though, he would go back into this creature's clutches. His lonely dead eyes haunted my thoughts, and I knew I couldn't leave him behind. I want you to give Agent 202 his freedom. Let him leave and do whatever he wants with his life. I said sternly, finally finding strength again. I heard an intake of air from inside the small tent. The creature sounded angry. Its entire body froze and I felt my chest tighten in fear. I felt as if I just did something very, very wrong. You, you just asked for one of my children. You dare ask a parent to give up a child? His voice rose with each word until the air itself around us shook. The fabric flared out behind it, giving it an appearance of wings flapping in the wind, still covering its face. And when I thought I couldn't take it any more, the thing waved a pale hand. Done. I have hundreds more. Anything else, small-minded child? My head was swimming. I was about to say no because... I really didn't want anything from these damn monsters, when the reason why I had entered the woods came to mind. If Sally Ann is still alive, please spare her and don't harm anyone from the town. <sighs> we do not harvest in the area we meet. That is a given. It appears the owner before you told you nothing. Now, I do not have any more time to waste. Be gone from my sight. Another wave of its hand and I was being dragged back from the men in suits. As I was being dragged, I felt a small sharp pain in my arm, causing me to look over. One of them had just jabbed me with a needle. I looked at him offended. Pretend this entire thing was a dream and stay the hell away from now on. He hissed, his voice barely above a whisper. When he finished speaking, whatever he had jabbed me with took over. My body felt limp and I dropped into a long, dark sleep. When I awoke again, my entire body was stiff. I felt like I'd slept for days and I learned that I had. Outside was a ruin of a downed tree. Outside was a ruin of downed tree branches and dead trees. My phone line was dead and my cell phone wasn't charged. But when I got it working again, I gathered up whatever information and listened to my hundreds of missed messages. From family. A huge storm had rolled in, cutting out the phone lines and power in the area the day I went into the woods, and so no one was surprised when I didn't return their calls. And because of the damage done, none of my family members could drive over to the cabin and see me. I already knew my grandfather had passed away and he'd left the cabin to me. But hearing it was still a shock. I made arrangements to get everything settled. I walked into town to get something to eat and found Sally Ann was perfectly fine. She'd hitched a ride down to the town over to get some special birthday present for her mother. Her phone had died and she didn't remember her mother's cell number to borrow a friend's phone to call. She felt so bad about everyone worrying about her and she was still apologizing for it. When I got back to the cabin after going into town for a brief trip, I saw a familiar SUV waiting for me. I was only drugged and sleeping for three days but the agent I asked to be saved already was recovered from the injuries that should have killed him. He leaned against his car, watching me walk up, eyes hidden behind his glasses. And he looked fine, dressed in a new suit. Aside from a set of new scars on his face, a line ran up from the corner of his mouth, 
up and under his glasses and cut through his eyebrow on both sides of his face. Another line started up the bottom corner of his mouth, giving it a segmented look. When I stopped a few steps from him, he silently stared, the air tense between us. He then stood up with his hands in his pockets, and without a word, he gave my foot a kick with a side of his polished dress shoes, and with a scowl on his face. Ah, you're just like a grandfather. Can't leave well enough alone. Gotta go chasing after nonsense. Well, I could tell he was angry from his side kicking me, and I took it. I could have died because I didn't listen to him. When I hear him mention my grandfather, it made me wonder how old 202 really was. When he was finished kicking me, he turned his back on me. I thought he was just going to leave, but he spoke again. Is he really gone? He asked finally. Yes, I'm sorry. I replied and I meant it. Now, this man might have known my grandfather better than I ever did. If he was as old as I thought, he might have made the hard choice of leaving someone he cared about behind as he started a family and the agent kept doing his mysterious job with unnatural creatures. So, uh, that big monster thing that nearly ate me? Well, that was Hans, huh? He really is an ass. His back was still turned and he gave a snicker, and it eased some tension. Ah, what are you going to do now? Keep the cabin, or do the wise thing and sell it? He asked, looking over his shoulder at me. I don't think I could do that to someone. You guys are stuck with me for a while, I guess, I said, shrugging. Ah, you should do what your grandfather did. Raise a family and keep his nose out of things that was none of his business. Ah, you're my friend. You are my business. I was a little bit embarrassed to say, but... Even more so to hear. The agent stared at me, mouth slightly open, as color started to come to his ears. And trying to hide his reaction, he started his sidekick and again, harder this time. And I couldn't help but laugh as I stepped away, trying to dodge his pitiful attacks. Go, get married, he yelled, and raised a finger at me, and then stomped over to his SUV. And yanking open the door, he started the car but didn't drive just yet. And after a few seconds, the window came down, and he leaned out a little. Am I going to see you next year? Well, you can drop by whenever you want, I offered. Oh, and hey, do you have a real name? Like, <laughs> 202, well, that's a mouthful. Well, he sat thinking about how to answer. Well, my parent has a, a lot of children. They ran out of names after 30 of us, so no. But I guess you can give me a nickname. The offer was so sudden I wasn't able to think of one on the spot. I searched through my mind, trying to come up with anything. And the seconds dragged on, and I picked the first thing that I could think of. Uh, Tuli? I mean, it's a real surname, and it sounds like two. Sort of. I felt embarrassed by my horrible naming skills. Ah, uh, you're just as bad at naming as my parent. Hans is called that because it sounds like Hans. Oh, that's... That's so stupid. I said no one. I wasn't much better. Truly it is, I guess. Wait. No, I changed my mind. Give me a second. I can think of something better. Nope. Need to go. I'll see you later. I stood, helpless as he drove away, leaving me in the dust. I could die of embarrassment. I was only alive because of this man, and I gave him the world's worst nickname in exchange. Until I saw him again, I would think of a better one. After all, whatever that was in those woods, I will be coming again. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. Certainly another one. Wow. What a spellbinding story this was, but the incredible mind of 02321 over on Reddit No Sleep. Something a little bit different, but executed perfectly. Of course, a big thank you to the author for allowing me to narrate the series on the show. I really did enjoy your work, and I certainly look forward to more of your work in the future. Well, guys and girls as ever, you know the drill. Please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help with the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear? and DMT's Cryptid Crew. If you have a story to share with us on the show, 
or would just like to get in touch with me, then please do at the brand new contact email, which is as on screen. Contact the dead one at gmail.com. I really look forward to hearing from you. I hope you all had a fantastic week at work or school, or whatever it is that you do. I hope you're throwing yourself in and giving it 100%. But above all, guys, remember, be safe, not sorry.